Okay, so I'm going to make the case to you today that um, all member sites aren't the same. When you walk on a member site, if we were doing a member's tour, and those of us who like member sites were taking you to six members' uh, Pueblos, you'd all be going, oh God, they all look the same. What are they doing here? Why aren't they letting us see something else? Um, I'm going to make a case to you that they may look the same on the surface, but detailed analysis suggests that they're not the same at all. And so what held members together as members? That's the question. So what is members? Uh, you may know that members is a river. Um, it's that river right there. It flows out into the desert and disappears. Um, it's very lush. It was a great place to make a living in the past if you were a farmer. It remains a great place to make a living, but there are few farmers left uh, there. It is an archaeological culture, um, and it's characterized by this stunningly beautiful pottery that everybody knows, well, most everybody, um, and that they make t-shirts and refrigerator magnets out of. <laughs> So, it's one culture, but there's tremendous variation in it. And the question is, what holds it together? Okay, so I'm gonna focus on the Members Classic, um, which is a time period. It's 1000 to 1130. It's very brief in archeological terms. It may not even be that long. It's characterized by the first Pueblos in the Members area, very early Pueblos in the Southwest too, um, cobble-walled rooms, and this is what a reconstruction of one of those would look like. Um, the rooms form room blocks, um, sort of like our houses. And it's characterized by this beautiful pottery. You might think that all the pottery has human and animal designs on it, but in fact, most of the painted black on white pottery is geometric, but stunning geometrics, um, really fine line work. And I'm going to focus on large classic members Pueblos, um, the ones that have more than 100 rooms. There are 13 of them in the members Valley, more or less, and probably about 13 of them outside the members Valley. And this is one that we excavated and that I'm going to talk about today, the Maddox site. Um, and that's in the process of excavation. OK. So what are the differences I'm going to talk about in general, in general? Um, I'm going to point out that there's a lot of variation in these sites, of course. At two of the sites, there's a lot of ritual going on. And that makes those two sites different. Which is surprising because unlike Chaco Canyon, we don't think that there are any elites in the members area. There's nobody who, by their birth, is set apart from anybody else. There are specialists, but they don't set themselves apart. Um, so there's lots of ritual at these two sites, and there's clearly ritual specialists working at these sites, living at them probably. At some classic sites, people didn't make pottery. Um, there are differences in site histories. Some sites have a lot of pit structures underneath them. You know that pit structures are underground structures. The floor is dropped. In the case of members, maybe as much as six feet below the ground surface, and there's a ramp entry in. And those are an earlier form of house from about 700-ish hmm, AD, the big ones, the deep ones, until about 1,000. Some sites have a lot of them. Some sites don't have many. Um, everyone wasn't the same. Everyone didn't live in the same social setting, the same social context. And so what did hold them together? I'm not saying, by the way, that everyone out there wasn't <coughs> members, because they most certainly were members in a way that we'll talk about. Okay, but what are the similarities that, if you know much about members, you would already know. Um, these big classic sites of more than 100 rooms, they always have a big pre-classic Great Kiva, a big underground structure, maybe 10 meters across, 10 yards across, um, underground. But by the beginning of the classic period, 1,000 AD-ish or so, they're gone. That's important. Um, they have the cobble-walled rooms and room blocks, like I said, and they have burials, human burials, below the room floors. This is not necessarily common around the Southwest. And they have this black on white pottery, called Members Classic, huh? Easily, easy enough. There's only one type, 
It's all Members Classic. All painted pottery is Members Classic with like five bowls that are different types. And you'll see, I mean, I'm showing you some of the most spectacular pots on these slides, but it's quite a bit different than anything else that happened in the Southwest at this time, anything else that happened in the Southwest after this. Because the, a lot of these pots tell stories, they're narratives. And you don't see that much in other pottery in the Southwest. So let's look more closely at the pottery because this is gonna turn out to be important. You might think that the nicest, the most interesting, whatever you wanna call it, the most finely painted pottery of, in the member style would only be at like those two ritual sites, right? Because that would be the important place for these important pots to be. But in fact, every site in the Members Valley, all of the big ones, have finely painted vessels, and they all have what I call hero twins vessels. Um, I'm gonna talk about hero twins in the next, but those are pictures of um, episodes from the hero twins saga, creation saga. Within the sites, all room blocks have finely painted vessels and hero twins vessels. So nobody, nobody gets all the fancy stuff. Um, it's all spread out there. If you take this and, lo and look at it another way, Michelle Hegman and her associates have determined, something we all thought for 40 years, but she actually put numbers to it, that no painted design associates with any site or room block. That is, there's a, a bunch of frog designs on Mimbrous Pottery. And, but the frogs don't associate with any one site. They don't associate with any room block in a site. Pretty much every site gets frogs. Um, every site gets birds. Every site gets fish. Every site gets hero twins. Um, the vessels designs don't associate with any age, person's age, with children or adults. They don't associate particularly with men or women. Again, everybody has access to these things. So there's a widespread distribution of both <laughs> the best, whatever that means to my eyes, um, of all the figurative designs, which I think are religious symbols, and they're accessible to everyone, okay? Let's look a little bit at the Hero Twins, because this is, in some ways, the crux of the matter. The Hero Twins saga is common in Mexico, in Mayan Mexico. It is the creation story. It's um, a description of Mesoamerican cosmology and religion, and it was written down in very early historic times in a document called the Pobol Vuh. Um, it depicts, it talks about the Hero Twins' miraculous birth, their epic adventures, their reincarnation as the sun and the moon. They were tricksters, they vanquished monsters, they willingly suffered death. Um, you see in this bowl, for example, the hero twins, which are two young men, um, transforming from catfish, they've been dead, and they um, are living again, they're transforming from catfish to young boys. They're going to fool the gods here. Okay. So let's look specifically at how member sites are different from each other. I've, I've shown you some similarities. I've mentioned some differences. Let's talk about um, the first difference. There are two ritual centers, as near as we can tell. And we were surprised by this. Um, this is not something we knew 40 years ago when we started doing members archaeology. To us, all the sites really did look the same at that point. But the two sites are Old Town in the south end of the valley and the Galaz site at the north end of the valley. Um, they're different from other sites because they have ceremonial precincts. Let me see, where are we here? Okay. The ceremonial precinct at Old Town is right in here and it consists of a series of at least three great kivas, sequential great kivas. There's also probably a road segment, like a Chaco and road that comes into that ritual precinct. Yes. Um, Galaz also has a ritual precinct. Again, at least three great kivas um, in the same location at the north end of the site. No road, but we wouldn't have been able to see the road anyway. 
Um, both of these sites have a lot of scarlet macaws that originally would have come from a thousand miles to the south in Mexico-ish. Um, they have a whole bunch of other things that set them apart from the other member sites. They're not bigger, they're not bigger, but um, they are different. Old Town looks like this today. It looks like a World War I battlefield. Those are potholes. This is BLM land. This is federal land. It's been extremely pothunted. I, I had a pot hunter tell me um, once that he was down 15 feet at Old Town, of course illegally ex digging, and he found somebody else's shovel. That's how badly looted this site is. And you can see a couple of bulldozer trenches here as well. Um, Galaz was completely bulldozed by Frank Turley, um, and there's nothing left, as far as I know. It's gone. And so we can't use these sites. Both of these sites have had excavation done on them, and we have little snippets of information. Um, we know there's lots of macaws, for example. Um, but we can't get into the fine tuning and compare them to each other or to other classic member sites. I mean, what could we have learned, honestly? Um, or even if they were just preserved. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, so we turn to some sites that are not ritual sites in the same way. Um, and I'm going to talk about two sites today because they are the two sites that have data available, that you can make this kind of comparison. Um, they were looted somewhat, both on private land. They were previously excavated, both of them in the 20s and 30s, but neither has been bulldozed. Okay. So we'll settle for what we can get. Um, they're the only two such sites until the last five years or so um, when Barb Roth out of UNLV is excavating Elk Ridge. So, um, but both Nan and uh, Maddox have seen recent excavations by the Members Foundation and by Harry Schaefer. And you all know that publications are important because this is where we get these data that are going to give us these insights into people's lives in the past. Um, the Maddox site was excavated in the late 20s and early 30s, and there is a monograph on it. It's not great, but it's fine. Um, and then the Members Foundation, <coughs> Paul says I have to do this. Um, um, the Members Foundation excavated there in the 70s. Um, I got to write it out. It took me 40 years, um, <laughs> but it was published last no November, and it's a typical, I did it with Steve LeBlanc, who was the, um, who ran the Members Foundation. It's a typical Steve LeBlanc. Um, it's got lots of data in it. If you want to know about miscellaneous ground stone from the Maddox site, this is your book. Um, okay. And Harry Schaefer published his work at the Nan Ranch site uh, in the early 2000s as well. So we've got these materials. Um, Maddox, by the way, is the only member site that's open to the public. It's a wonderful thing that they, the local people have done there. Okay. So let's look at Maddox and Nan. Maddox here on the left, Nan on the right. Um, already they look a little different, right? Okay. So let's look at site histories first. Some sites, maybe most sites in the Members Valley, are used heavily through time. Often, Occupation on those sites starts in maybe the five or six hundreds, um, and it continues until 1130. That's a long time. Um, several hundred years, on and off, might not be continuous. Okay, so Nan Ranch has evidence of this. If you look at the Nan thing up here, there's, these are the pit structures that Harry excavated on the Nan Ranch. And those all date before 1000 AD, and you can see there's a bunch of them. So there's at least 200 years of pre-classic use on Nan. Um, there's a couple of great kivas I'm going to talk about in a second. On the Maddox site, there are three, count them three, um, pre-classic pit structures. That's it. There's not 52 like there are on Nan. Um, there's one great kiva. This is one of the pit structures on Maddox. And I think there's one or two families on the site, and that's all, before 1079, which is our first tree ring cutting date. 
Okay, let's look at those great kivas. These date to the late pit house period, which is before 1000 AD. Um, on the Nan, there are two of them, and they're sequential in time. One is earlier, one is later. And you notice that like Galaz and Old Town, they're close together in a precinct. Um, at Maddox, there's one, and this is the outline of it right here. We didn't excavate it. Uh, we put a couple test trenches in it. And so we've got a date. It was probably built sometime in the AD 900s. Um, and it associates with this room block here, which there's evidence for that room block being the first family on the site. So, and there's one of the three pit structures is right there underneath. So they lived in a pit structure for a while, and then they moved and they built a Pueblo, and they built the Pueblo right above the pit structure. I think that's important, and in line with it, too. And I think before, when they were living in the pit structure, that they built this great kiva. And you know, great kivas can be something that bring people together for ceremonies and for social events and that kind of thing, for religion. Um, but they built it in the 900s, and nobody came. I think it was a failure. I think people didn't like the way they were doing the ceremonies. I have no idea. I have no idea. But nobody came um, until the late 10 hundreds. So I think it's a failed great kiva. I don't know. Um, OK, here's another difference between Maddox and Nan, and that is in the Pueblo building itself. At Nan, there's a lot of earlier transitional structures. And these are structures that aren't pit structures, but they're not quite surface rooms either. So they're kind of there in the middle. And the structures that are cross-hatched here, underneath the dark-lined Pueblo rooms, are the transitional houses. Nan has a slug of them. Um, Elk Ridge has a slug of them. Um, you know, people were there in the pit houses, and they, then they built some other kinds of um, more ephemeral structures that mostly got obliterated when they put the Pueblo rooms on top. But, and so, as I was analyzed, as we were excavating Maddox, and as I was analyzing it later, I kept thinking, I should be seeing transitional structures. But there aren't any. Um, Maddox has none that we know of. Um, at Nan, the tree ring date suggests that Pueblo building starts in the 1040s. That's an approximate date. Um, at Maddox, our first tree ring date is 1079. There's really nothing before it. That's pretty late. When the period ends at 1130, and, and at Maddox, the latest tree ring date is 1117. So, you know, that's 40 to 50 years two or three generations. That's it. That's it at Maddox. Okay, so that's another difference. Here's a difference. Oh, well, this one makes sense. At Nan Ranch, they're producing pottery in both the late pit house. They're making pottery in both the late pit house and the classic periods. No problem. At Maddox, they don't start producing pottery until the classic period, probably because there's no one there. Um, one family. Um, so um, that one makes sense in terms of this model. Um, in terms of the organization of sites, Harry and I think that they're very different. And we originally had kind of a little argument about this, but it turns out I think we're both right. At Maddox, one household, I can make a case to you that one household occupies each room block, each collection of contiguous rooms. Um, and that they use those rooms sequentially. So at, at, in this room block at Maddox, those two big rooms right there, I think are the first rooms, there's architectural and tree ring dating evidence, those two are the first rooms in that room block. And then they build a suite of rooms right up in here. Then they built another suite of rooms that's later up here. And then the latest suite of rooms is down here. So I think it's one family and they move from suite of rooms to suite of rooms. They may add on. I mean, maybe there are two sisters living there at one time in their families. Hard to know. Um, that's certainly possible. Look at the construction of the, the two room blocks, the two big room blocks at Nan. There's this huge one right here. And then there's a smaller one that's actually very complicated right here. Um, Harry thinks that these are not families, that these are corporate groups, that these are families. Probably they're mostly related, they're kin, but 
they're acting together socially and economically. They're a larger group than a single family like we might see at Maddox. And so there are different social groups at both of these places, which suggest different kinds of social contexts in their everyday lives. Okay. So um, you might think, well, okay, so the artifacts are pretty much the same, right? Um, you know, everybody gets chip stone and ground stone and pottery and, and there's animal bone in the trash and, you know, plant remains and that kind of thing. They are similar. But when you start to break it out, you start to see a lot of differences. Maddox has the most stone hoes of any site that we know of in the Mimbers Valley. And you see this is a picture from 1930, an excavation. They have excavated a cache of stone hoes. I'm not sure these are really hoes, by the way. I don't know. Um, they're very thin, and they might be pretty fragile. Um, don't know. So, in the members and at Maddox, they're usually in caches, uh, collections of them. There's 47 in this cache. Uh, this isn't just five. We don't find any workshops. Um, but the concentration at Maddox suggests that somebody there produced them and maybe distributed them to other sites. I have no evidence of that. It's just that there's more of them there. Um, at Nan, there's no caches, there's no concentration. You know, there's a broken stone hoe here and a broken one there, and that's it. Okay. Let's look at greenstone axes. Here's one in color. This is a very dense, very heavy material that you make axes out of, and these are functional. Um, you can chop down trees with these. The source for this greenstone is between Maddox and Galaz. It's about a three-mile distance, and the geology, the greenstone pops out there. Um, at Maddox, we have flakes of greenstone. So they're clearly producing greenstone. Um, they're flaking this, these axes into a rough form, and then they're pecking them and smoothing them. It would be, in my mind, a lot of work. There, again, there's no workshops. Um, but again, the question is, are they produced at Maddox and then distributed? Okay. Marine shell. You all know that um, we find marine shell from the Gulf of California, often sometimes from the coast of California, um, in many southwestern sites. Maddox has very few um, pieces of marine shell. And this, from our excavation where we screened, we have something like 52 pieces of marine shell. Nan has several hundred. At Maddox, there are six kinds of shell, six genus and species of shell, different ones. Nan had 12. Um, we're talking about similar amounts of excavation, by the way. And so one of my questions is, did people at Maddox lack the connection to get the shell? Did they have any need to obtain the shell? Maybe they didn't need it. Um, they didn't want it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But it, it's a major difference. OK, so here's my summary. You can see, I hope, that I've made a case that these two sites are very different from each other. They look the same on the surface, but they're pretty different. Many pit structures, few pit structures. You can read it. You know what I've said. So as I put at the bottom, this is just a tangent. Um, when you think of archaeological cultures, this is one of the problems, is that term, members culture, just masks all this difference in people's lives and families' lives. Uh, living in the Mimbers Valley a thousand years ago. Okay. okay, so you could easily say, well, Pat, you know, you've only compared two sites, and one of them's your favorite, and you know, and you want it to be different. And so, but what about all the other sites that are out there? And we know something about these other four sites. Um, and so I put the maps up here, and. They look kind of different, too, right? Although when I put the maps up, I noticed that there are two big room blocks at Schwartz. And I knew this, at two at Cameron Creek, but you can really see it here. But in fact, the two at Schwartz are massive. And the, there's more than two at Cameron Creek that you can't see. But the structure of those sites, just from the maps, is different. Makes you wonder. And Old Town. Old Town's really cool. Um, down here, it looks like one massive room block. Wow, with some little side things going on. Hard to know, because it's so trashed. Okay, 
So what does this all mean? The differences between Maddox and Nan Ranch suggest to me that there are different social settings for people. Um, one is more family, one is a larger corporate group, for example. So what held them together? If, if there's all these differences, what holds everybody together? Okay, I think that the similarities in access to religious symbols, especially in the distribution of the fanciest designs, including the Hero Twins narrative pots. Um, I told you that the great kivas are not built after much after 1000 AD. They're not built and used. Many of them are burned in catastrophic fires. And it appears perhaps that the hero twins might be a new religion or a new aspect to religion, maybe meshing with the old, don't know. Um, so if people desired to interact, to participate in this new religion, even if they had different social settings in their lives, different social backgrounds, um, maybe that was what held them together, and I think indeed it was. It held them together for slightly more than 100 years, and then things didn't work out, at least in the members. Things worked out long term in the Pueblo and Southwest, but not in the members. Um, so I think it's religion that holds them together, but it's pretty fragile. So, in summary, there's lots of variation among the large members classic sites. There's many social groups and social contexts. Um, evidenced by equal access to all the bold designs, religion, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so, uh, so I, I hope made a convincing case for you here today um, that this is a possibility for how things worked in the past. But this is not a perfect model. Um, and, the, and the kicker is that over in the western members area, for example, as you get out of the members valley in almost all directions, there's no hero twins. There's no, none of the pottery with the human and animal figures on it. Um, it's just black on white pottery. And by the way, the room blocks are set up differently and everything looks different. It's all members, the pottery's all members. But clearly the people outside of the members valley either aren't buying this or um, don't, aren't allowed to participate. We just don't know what it is. And so, as with all endeavors like this, there's still a lot of questions and a lot of work that could be done. Thank you. <laughs> I'm allowed to, ask, to say you can ask questions. <laughs> well, you can't, but um, by the fact that nobody came to the site and lived there beyond that one family. Now there's a second big room block on the site that's north that, oh, that's owned by somebody else um, that we never excavated in. Um, and so in my mind there could be two um, families there. Um, but nobody else came to the site, yeah. And so I think it just fizzled, I don't know. Maybe it was successful and everybody went home after the ceremonies. <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's 11 macaws and parrots at Galaz. There's at least four, maybe six at Old Town, but Old Town was much more trashed. Um, the, the ones from Galaz came from the 1930s excavations. At Galaz, the macaws are all either in the north or south room block, I can't remember which, and the pots with the macaws painted on them are in the other room block. Um, that must mean something, don't know what. The Hero Twin story doesn't include macaws. Um, there's a monster called Seven Macaw, but he doesn't look like a macaw. I don't know how he got that name. Um, and so, um, but both, I think both the, the Hero Twin Saga and the Macaws originally probably came from the east coast of Mexico, from the Huasteca area. Um, I could be wrong. They could have gone in the other direction. Um, well, the Macaws couldn't have. Um, but um, but the, the Hero Twin Saga could be earlier, and it could be Pan-American, um, certainly. Um, Unclear 
at this point uh, to anyone, I think. And so the fact that those two things could have come, the macaws and the, and the sada, could have come north um, suggests to me that they're related to each other. But in Mesoamerica, they're not particularly. Although that area where the macaws originally came from is, um, what was I going to say, is a big macaw trading area, apparently, in prehistory. Um, uh, but it's not part of the Hero Twins. Yeah, Don. Um, do you draw any concurrence between the disappearance of the Great Kivas and the uh, appearance of the Hero Twin? Yeah, um, I do. I do. I do. But I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, and if it's Pan American and it came over the Bering Land Bridge or down the West Coast or wherever, it's then it's always been here, yeah. So um, that's the kicker in that one that I don't know the answer to. But yes, I, I see the Hero Twins iconography, which is unique in the Southwest, um, and the disappearance of the Great Kivas to be very closely linked. Uh, but of course, Great Kivas come back after, not in the members, but in other parts of the Pueblo and Southwest, Great Kivas come back, or we're always there, and the Hero Twins continue uh, to this day in um, parts of the um, ritual. I don't know about iconography of the twins. Um, I don't know rock art very well, but there is a macaw rock art piece at Pony Hills. Life-size, beautiful, uh, on a rock, uh, on the ground. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's usually the same stone. Um, Harry thinks that the, the source is up in the Gila wilderness today, to the north. Um, I don't know about beyond the Members Valley. That's actually an interesting question. But yes, all Members Classic sites have holes. But usually they have three or four, and often they're broken. And they don't come in those caches. There's a cache of Schwartz. But, um, but Maddox just stands out as having a, a larger number. It may mean nothing, you know, because most of them, the 47, were in the one cache, and that's a one-time thing. So don't know. But, but From the greenstone, there's chipstone flake, greenstone flakes. Peggy would have um, recorded them. <laughs> um, um, at Maddox, suggesting. And I, and I don't think Harry would have missed them at Nan, so I think they aren't there. I know that's another whole lecture. Yeah, that's a Peggy lecture. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it, it looks like a nut. Some people stay there. We don't know how many. It doesn't look like a lot. Some people move over the Black Range, which rises to 10,000 feet, into the area that Peggy and Michelle Hegman did a, a, a long-term research project on, called the Eastern Members, this side of the Rio Grande, but what, east of the Members. Um, other than that, we really don't know because the next set of chronometric dates that we have um, is in the 1200s. So there's a big, over a hundred year gap between that, the last Turing date's 1128, um, and the next set of tree ring radiocarbon archaeomagnetic dates. And so we really don't know. We think people are there, um, but they're not building big substantial structures. Um, but eventually they do. And, um, and there are two sequential sets of adobe walled problems, not cobble walled, uh, with different pottery. Doesn't look like members. Um, so something happens. Peggy calls it a reorganization. I think that's a good word. No, no. Um, the macaws, which are the only material thing, um, Hmm? Yeah, yeah, but they're not material. You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm completely wrong, and those aren't the hero twins at all. It's just that we can see the entire saga on members' pots 
Every episode is represented. Um, Chaco Canyon, which is exactly the same time as Mimbris, has more macaws than Mimbris has. And so you might think you'd see Mimbris pottery in Chaco and Chaco pottery in Mimbris, right? Or something, but there's nothing. There's nothing that connects them except the fact that they both have macaws. Makes me crazy. Ben looks like he might say something here. <laughs> when Hauri, Emil Hauri, defined the Magillon in the 1930s, he said it was Magillon until 1000 AD, because it was brownware. It was brown, red on brown pottery. He was wrong, but. Um, <laughs> but at 1000 AD, people living in the Magillon area, um, along the Magillon Rim to the south, were swamped, he uses that word, by people from the ancestral Pueblo and Anasazi area. Um, and that's why you get the black on white pottery, because it's Anasazi, it's ancestral Puebloan. Except, of course, you're getting black on white pottery in the Mimbris area at 800-850 AD. And unfortunately, I never did to ask him um, how, how, what he meant by all of that. Because he must have had a reason, but I don't know what it was. Um, and so we in the Southwest tend to look to the North um, for everything. And Paul and Susie Fish would tell us to look to, and Paul Menace, to look to the South as well. Not as far as the high civilizations of Mesoamerica, but directly South, you know, what's now Chihuahua, Sonora, Durango, um, those areas, um, to learn more. Uh, not as far away as Mexico City or the Mayan area. I think that's true. But even if there were one or two sherds, it would still be that the majority of sherds that you find outside the Mimbris region as a whole, the vast majority, 99%, are not figurative. Yeah. Which is interesting. Because, you know, pots break, and they have little figures on them when they break, and they could be moved, you know, around as, as uh, a, a token of your visit or something like that, and they don't move, um, whatever that's worth. But there are member shirts out there, very clearly, um, on the landscape. So, okay, thank you. <laughs>